and welcome, welcome to our panel discussion on alternative approaches to home ownership. Thank you all so much for joining us for this hour uh, of engaging conversation. Really grateful for the support folks coming to, to learn more about these forms of housing. So before we start, I'm going to do our land and labor acknowledgement that we like to do here at Urban Homeworks. Uh, we acknowledge that we live our lives and do on work, our work that European colonizers stole from the Dakota peoples indigenous to Minnesota. We also acknowledge that we live our lives and do our work on land that was cultivated and developed by bodies that European colonizers stole from West African countries through the transatlantic state slave trade. In order for these thefts to occur, sadistic acts of genocide, rape, and forced assimilation were employed. We acknowledge what was taken from our collective human ancestors. As we do so, we commit to work and fight for the liberation of the descendants of those enslaved through American chattel slavery and the sovereignty of all native peoples. So a few housekeeping items for those of you um, who it would be helpful, there is a closed captioning option. Um, do a button at the bottom of your screen. If you're comfortable, we'd love it for you to leave your video on um, for, we, for us to be able to engage in dialogue and kind of know who we're talking about or talking to, that feels really nice. Um, and if you can remain muted uh, during the event, that would be really helpful. There will be a brief question and answer session at the end of the panel. Uh, if you have questions, you can send them in the chat throughout the event, starting now, if you wish, um, and we'll get gather them for that um, closing section at the end. Uh, and the team would really like you all to use speaker view for uh, this panel which will highlight all of our experts that are here with us today. So I'll give you all a moment to orient to that. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, my name is Asali Sol. I'm the executive director of Urban Homeworks. I use they, them pronouns. Uh, at Urban Homeworks, our vision is neighbors raising their collective voices to address injustice and overcome the barriers that perpetuate inequity. We transform condemned, underutilized, and neglected properties into safe, dignified rental or home ownership opportunities for low to moderate income, primarily Black and Indigenous households, using housing as a platform to combat racial wealth gaps and create broader social change. We work to build community between neighbors, businesses, and contractors in North and South Minneapolis and Frogtown in St. Paul. And we address the issues residents face inside and outside of the home with community-centered care by helping neighbors build stable foundation needed to further overcome the barriers that perpetuate inequity and make their dreams a reality. I'm so excited about our panel today. Uh, we are joined by some incredible allies in the housing justice movement, who I will have introduce themselves. Um, and we'll start off with um, Mel Yoon. If you could just give a brief intro of, you know, name, pronouns, and organization. Hi, I'm Mel Yoon Yahye with Hope Community, um, and I use she, her pronoun. I'm the Community Ownership Program Coordinator. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here, Mel Yoon. Lena. Hi, my name is Lena Gardner. I'm the current executive director of the Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism. And we are undertaking a cooperative housing initiative um, with in partnership with Urban Homeworks. And I am spearheading that on the blue side. Yes, thank you so much, Lena. Coco. Hey, everybody. I'm Coco. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the deputy director at Rondo Community Land Trust. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us, Coco. 
So before we dig into these very specific and unique forms of homeownership, I just want to set us up with a little bit of background to make sure we're all on the same page and understanding why um, alternative forms of homeownership are needed. You know, as we do the work that we do here at Urban Homeworks, we've really been digging into the data um, within the communities that we serve and recognize that where we do our work, um, there's a, a history of di divestment and extraction, um, particularly within BIPOC communities such as Rondo, Phillips, South, um, I'm sorry, near North, Jordan, North Minneapolis, where the average area median income in those communities is around 40%. And so these families are competing like the rest of us in a pretty rigorous market um, with home with potential home buyers like corporate investors who are able to pay cash uh, on hand and then turn homes into high cost rentals. We also recognize that systemic barriers um, that have existed for a long time, continue to persist. Um, banking relationships are a challenge, getting that first mortgage, um, having um, a trusting, um, just having like trusting relationships in those financial institutions continues to be a challenge in our communities, um, as well as the, the limited access to down payment assistance or down payment funds. Um, when families don't have multi-generational wealth to tap into, it can be really difficult to purchase that first home. And so at Urban Homeworks, we recognize uh, these financial barriers um, and, and that we have to create pathways that lower the cost of homes for sale, um, that build homes intended specifically for lower median income families as deep as 50 to 60% of the area median income, and, and of course, recognizing that as the homeownership gap widens, the wealth gap also widens. And so having opportunities for families of lower income to achieve passive income will also help close the gap. And so we're super excited about the folks that are here today because they are working on initiatives that address each of those components. And so I'd love to dive in. Um, and Mel, you and I'm going to kick it off to you first for you to talk first a little bit about who Hope Communities is and the project that you are spearheading. Yeah, I'm Mel Yoon. Hope Community is located on um, Franklin and Portland. We do a lot of work um, in terms of housing. Um, we do a lot of garden work where we teach people about food access and how to grow food. We do a lot of works with parks, making sure that all the parks in Minneapolis have the same uh, master plan or they get the same, um, you know, same materials. Um, so in terms of my work, um, um, I do the community ownership program coordinator. So the community ownership project was started on 2020, right on the pandemic, like as we were closing the office. So, um, and usually a lot of our work is like organizing and door knocking and meeting people. So I, we were not able to do that. Like we had to pivot our work to online to make sure that like we, we stay safe and we keep with the community members safe. So um, yeah, the program was started 2020 um, because we noticed that rent is going up and um, people are moving out of Phillips and like, uh, or, you know, they move in places past Anoka and et cetera, where they don't have the community resources they need. So, uh, we started this program called Honor Occupant. Basically, you will buy a duplex and you will live on one side of the duplex and rent out the other side of the duplex. So uh, we work with, you know, we partner with the land trust, City Lakes Land Trust to make sure that like people can get into the duplex affordably. Um, we, um, when, they, when they complete our six week training, they're able to apply for down payment assistance on top of the land trust. Um, so yeah, our program is six week, six week training initially it was five week but we added extra week um first week is introduction second week is um we partner with city legs land trust they come in they talk about what their model is uh, um and like how the land trust model works and like how you build um equity with that um that you own you know you, the land trust owns the land and you own the house and what does that mean 
um, in terms of like if you decide to sell um, and how much how much um, how much uh, down payment they bring to you when you when you're applying for the land trust model. Uh, and then the third week we partner with NDC. We have a training that comes a trainer that comes in and talks about the importance of the business model. So like um, the business model, like you have to, as a landlord, you know, like you are you're still a landlord. You're running a business. Your phone has to be on 24 hours. If someone cannot answer, like if you cannot answer your phone, let's say like somebody's toilet overflows, what does that mean? And then we uh, we partner with um, NDC. We partner with uh, model cities, and they come in. We have a uh, Miss Linda White who comes in, and she talks about the importance of credit and what credit means. So like um, people learn about credit, how to improve their credit resources, and then they can connect with Miss Linda because she's a credit expert. Um, they can work with her around their credit while they're in the training or after the training, whatever is convenient for them. Then we also partner with Homeline. We have a tenant lawyer that comes in. Uh, so basically he talks about the laws and regulations. You have to follow as a landlord, let's say a tenant is not paying you, you know, rent on time. What does that mean? Um, like, do you, you know, what is the eviction process looks like? It means that you cannot lock that person out. You have to go through the court process and get like, you know, get the sheriff involved and get like um, a judge to approve eviction. So yeah, we talk about those things and like um, making sure that you fix things. And like, you know, when you're in a tenant house that like anything, you know, you could be recorded. So you have to follow, um, you have to keep yourself professionally. And what does that mean? So, and then um, the last week um, we do a comparison of like, what's left to own uh, a duplex in the traditional model if you don't use the land trust. What is it, you know, what does that math look like? And like, if you use the land trust, how much money you're saving over time and what that looks like. So we talk, we do a spreadsheet showing people the difference. And then uh, we uh, partner with Bell Bank. We have um, Miss Tiffany coming from Bell Bank and she talks about, um, she's a loan officer. She talks about uh, how to get into home ownership um, and like, um, like, you know, your credit, they'll, they'll, they'll look at your credit, they'll look at your paychecks, you know, your w, W9s and all that stuff. So after the six weeks, we do individualize one-to-one -one with people. So like, um, we, you know, let's say there's 14 people that graduate from our program. We do like, oh, we reach out to one of each of them and be like, hey, when do you want to buy? What resources do you need? Like, you need me to connect you, Miss Linda, from Model Cities uh, for your credit. You know, do you want a Tiffany's phone number? Uh, what do you need? And like we, you know, and then we say, what is the barrier? It's like some people may be like a lot of barrier are like, oh, I don't, my credit's not there. So we connect, we connect people with Miss Linda. Um, that's the most barriers like people credit, people's credit is not there. So and that's that's fine. So far we have uh, we we have done six cohorts. Um, so that's that's what the program is. If you if you have specific questions, I, I'm happy to answer. Um, that was great, Molly, and thank you so much. Uh, you all are doing a very comprehensive program, which I'm excited to dig in uh, deeper into. Um, I'd love for Lena and Coco just to get a chance to explain the overview of their programs as well. So Lena, I'll kick it off to you next. Thanks. So we are doing a cooperative housing project and cooperative housing is a specific type of housing that's different from single family home ownership and different from renting, but you can kind of think of it as in the middle. Um, there are, and the benefits are usually around accessibility or wealth building um, or somewhere in the middle there. Our program that we are designing in partnership with Urban Homeworks is um, focused a little bit more on accessibility. Um, so folks will only need about $1,000 down payment to, able, to be able to buy a share and then occupy a brand newly built four bedroom, 2.5 bath house. Um, and so that's not something that you're able to do anywhere in the country currently. So we're excited about this project. The project is um, designed for uh, Black and Indigenous single families, um, and in part that has to do with the wealth extraction and land theft from both of those communities. So we're also seeing this as a housing justice reparative 
project and it's why we designed it that way. Um, I'm not sure how, my, you know, how many details to give around the differences between a condo and a cooperative, but I think one thing that's helpful to note for folks as I talk about this project is that in a cooperative structure, the homeowners, the folks who have occupied the homes, are also the people who run and own the cooperative. So they have control over the policies of what governs all the homes. In a condo structure, that's not true. There's another entity called a homeowner association, which has the power to dictate those policies. And so um, you basically, it's more of like a landlord renter relationship in that respect. You have less power and control over what's the, the governing policies of the of the organization. So that's also a reason why we opted for a cooperative structure is because we really believe that people need to have autonomy and need to be self-determined. And it's really difficult to do that if you have another entity coming in and saying, you can't remodel your inside of your house if that's something you really want to do. Whereas in the cooperative structure, at least there's opportunity for you to open up that discussion within the context of everyone who's a part of the cooperative um, and say, I'd like to do this. You know, is there, is is there a way we can make that happen? Um, and so you have a little bit more control in that respect. Um, I think that, yeah, this project is very unique also in that we are getting some significant funding from the city. Um, so that that's important because each of these homes cost about $300,000 to build, but we're able to sell them from $189,000 for $189,000 around there. Um, so that's a huge important piece of it. Um, and our model for wealth building is what's called a principal pass-through model, um, which is a little bit unique. Um, and so it's certainly not, you wouldn't be, getting the same amount of equity as you would in a single family home, but you will be getting something if you decide, if somebody decided they wanted to leave the cooperative, you would be getting essentially what you paid in. You would get that out to take with you to your next place, um, which is a little different from other no equity or group equity co-op models where all of that money stays with the co-op um, so that they can, they essentially operate like a, a affordable rental program. So ours again is kind of in the middle. Um, so balancing just that accessibility versus wealth building and trying to get a good balance there is was one of the main goals so that families are walking away with some equity um, and they're still able to access it, access the units um, with a low amount down. Um, I think the other benefit of cooperative living is less financial and it's more social emotional, right, around collective living and helping support each other as families living together in a shared space, even though the units are separate and each family has its own uh, home. Um, that's still to say, as those of us, I mean, perhaps all of us know that we need community, we need connection, and our lives are all enriched when we can help each other out. Um, and so the idea behind the cooperative living too is that um, you're going to help each other out. You're going to, you're going to try to find different ways that feel good to everybody to be living collectively versus just like, I'm in my lane doing my thing. And that works well for some people. That's also a key difference in a condo situation. It's like most of the people here, they're not, um, you know, and most of the people in a condo aren't going to want to maybe have dinner together or buy food together or think about babysitting shares together or exchanges together. Whereas in a cooperative, that is part of the intentional goal is community building and collective living in ways that help everybody um, thrive in a, in a really brutal world. So that's a little bit about our project. That's great, Lena. Thank you. And I know that there's so much more there too. So excited to circle back to you with specific questions, but definitely want to give Coco the opportunity to give us an overview of the work that the Rondo Community Land Trust is doing. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So Rondo Community Land Trust has been around since 
1993, so it's our 30th birthday this year. Uh, and Land Trust has come up a, a couple times in comments so far, so maybe I'll just do a little bit of just 101, very basic, what is the land trust? So uh, in a land trust model, we remove land out from the for-profit, speculative, and volatile real estate market by using a shared equity ownership structure. So the, the simplest way to explain it is that the CLT retains ownership of the land forever through a ground lease um, uh, document, but a, a homeowner or business, because uh, we can do residential and commercial, uh, own uh, the structure on the land um, as long as they want to, to own it. Uh, and it can be passed down to family and future generations as well. Um, so the way that the I, I talked about shared equity home ownership, so similar to uh, sort of uh, balancing between uh, wealth building and sort of what we really consider access and housing stability and perpetual affordability for multiple generations. What we what, what our model does is bring a significant amount of resource on the front end for a buyer, uh, but in exchange they're agreeing that when they choose to sell, if they choose to sell, they'll walk away with a 25% split of that equity and 75% would stay with the actual asset and pass on to the next family. So it's kind of a pay it forward uh, concept. So to put, to put that in real terms, uh, I, I just wanna share maybe an example to, to give some numbers too. So in, 20, uh, in 2004, we had a, a single um, headed household uh, purchase a home for a, about a, $149,000 uh, thanks to sort of the, the supports that we were able to bring as a, as a land trust. So this individual then was able to sort of stabilize, uh, save uh, during their, their tenure in that, in that uh, home. And in the meantime, went back to school, actually earned a PhD and then opened a black therapy practice in our community and rents out of one of our commercial spaces. Um, soon after that, uh, she actually chose to sell uh, her CLT home and uh, enter into the for-profit market. So in that time span, she sold actually in 2022. So that was a pretty long permanence. Usually we see about seven to 10 years and then we see a resale happen. Um, so that home then that again was purchased initially at $150,000 basically let's just round that up was sold in 2022 to another single family household single uh head of household um I think it was a seven person uh family uh and uh the the home had appreciated in value so it went up to $213,000 um but uh, we were able to get this other family in uh, for for just a tad bit more uh, at one hundred and ninety thousand, and so see so see how that sort of pay it forward uh, stays with the home and enables access to another family down the road, um, along with all the other benefits that I talked about going back to school, opening a business, et cetera. So that's really the value add we see as part of the land trust model in particular. So we have a number of ways in which we kind of like um, support folks into that home ownership. Um, and I won't get into all the, the different programs. I'll just say one of them is our home buyer initiated program, which is the most popular because it provides that agency to the family. So basically we just figure out what can you, what can we afford with what you're bringing to the table, what we're bringing to the table. And then folks just literally go out and shop for the home that's within that budget. So we don't, get into saying, well, no, nope, you can only buy in this neighborhood, you can only buy in this on this street or whatever the things are. Um, what makes Rondo CLT unique uh, within uh, the landscape of land trust, which there are like 350 in the nation, 13 in the state of Minnesota is, one, we are residential and commercial. So in terms of thinking about circular economies and how we can be intentional in supporting um, um, individuals and families through home ownership and into business opportunities, that's that's a, a place where we're uniquely positioned. And secondly, um, 
we also have a reparative framework onto the work that we're doing just because of the origins of the of the Rondo neighborhood in particular and the the kind of widespread economic violence that occurred when uh, I-94 was built and uh, eradicated 700 homes, 300 businesses, and it's estimated that $157 million in intergenerational wealth was stripped, which I think is an underestimation, to be honest with you. And so um, that reparative work uh, lives in our right to return programs that provide uh, first right of refusal to all of our commercial spaces in Rondo to historic Rondo residents and descendants, uh, as well as additional cash assistance for folks trying to come back into the neighborhood and buy a home. Um, we also administer the inheritance fund through the city of St. Paul, which is new, uh, and are, are, are beginning to replicate this work in other communities like Wesco, where they're pursuing redress of the flats and so forth. So we see ourselves sort of as a vessel that can support then the contextual um, the, and place-based power of cultural communities, like where they, you know, where they, where they sit and wh where, um, where those um, connections uh, are strong. Um, I'll, I guess I'll stop there. There's more I could say, but uh, I'll pause. That was great. Thank you so much, Coco. Um, so I'd love for us to kind of dig in a little bit to uh, the families that move through these programs and and really even how they came to be. I know, for example, uh, Hope Communities is doing something really unique, which is affording families that opportunity for a passive income. And Mel Yoon, I know that um, this is something that is close to you specifically. And so I would love to just ask you to dive in a little bit on what, how, the, how the program is supporting families, those specifics, and, and some of the outcomes that you have seen for, for your families through that program. Yeah, so we had, total we had four graduates buy homes. Um, so, there was um, one person. Uh, they were buying it. They were buying it with their fiance, so they made over the limit, so they couldn't quali qualify for the land trust or for the family housing down payment program. So, so they were able to, but they were able to still go through, just get the educational and go through our program and buy a single family home. Um, and then we had another person that went through our program that um, used the family housing fund and was able to buy in West Saint Paul. Um, a duplex and a dwelling a house with a dwelling so I just talked to them last week and they were telling me that her husband's family were from Hayton and they like were her um her his family came over and they're renting from them so that was in that was like you know interesting that like they brought family over and they're renting from them so that's like exciting we have another person uh that bought from um Powderhorn Park uh, a duplex and they you know right away they find people to rent from um so i haven't had i have that's like you know i was scared that people might not find you know renters especially like with the current you know market uh and that's opposite i think for us the biggest problem has been um the supply so we have a lot of people that are ready in terms of home ownership that we help them build their credit that are ready to get into home ownership but the thing is they cannot find a duplex that's on like, you know, 275, you cannot find a duplex on that price uh, today, today in today's age. So um, it's, we have some people that don't qualify for the land trust and like um, that, that can't take the, you know, that can't take advantage of the land trust, uh, but then it's hard to find a duplex that's on 300 and like um, most duplex are going for above 300 and et cetera. So, um, we're trying to create a pathway. We're partnering with uh, other organizations to create a pathway uh, for for our people to get into home ownership. We're, we're partnering with the Land Bank, which is another organization that's buying up some duplexes and basically is to give it back to the community, uh, whether Rwanda buys it or um, it's just to give it back to people. So we're trying to partner with them to create pathways to say, hey, so that when people graduate from our program that they are ready, they can go and say, we, we can say, hey, we have a duplex that we can sell to you 300 or, or, or 280, whatever you qualify for, and you can take advantage of the land trust or the, and, and use the family housing down payment program. 
to get into that reflex. So, but right now, I think our biggest challenge has been like supply. Like, okay, that's fair, and we know that supply for deeply affordable homes is incredibly limited in the Twin Cities. Mel Yoon, can you speak to the challenge that challenges that you see having to navigate families through specifically? Because it is a very unique model, right? Where you're not only planning for your own family, but you're thinking about how to support a resident in a respectful community-centered way um, and make sure you have the resources that you need for that opportunity. Um, how is HOPE supporting families in that? And, and what do those challenges look like? Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, like we do one to one with indiv individualized one to one with folks after they complete our program. So like, um, let's say someone says, "Oh, my credit, I my credit is not there." That's what's that's the barrier to for me to get into home ownership. Mm -hmm. So then we say, "Okay, connect with model cities. Here's models. Here's the person that can help you in model cities. Connect with them, and I'll check with back with you in three months." So like, I think for me, I, in the terms of like getting them prepared, we do that. Um, I think that the hardest piece is like, uh, some people wanting to rent their families and what does that look like when you, you know, when you become a, a landlord and like, you know, are you sure your family member is gonna pay you? What does that look like if they don't pay you, you know? So considering those topics is one of, you know, one of them is like, um, some people are like, oh, I don't think I wanna do that. I, I wanna rent to an individual. It's much easier to rent to a community member than my brother or something like that, so. We do have those tough conversations, but then a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people have the intention. I think that they want to provide low income housing. They want to provide affordable housing as they got this duplex affordably. So um, that's the mission. That's great. I think we can all imagine the challenge of renting to our family members. So appreciate you uh, breaking that down for folks and walking them through it. Um, what? Um, what kind of income le levels does your program target? Like, what do folks need to come to the table with to participate in this program? Yeah, um, so we we go by the land trust model. So, like, you know, um, if you qualify for the land trust model, uh, you can you can qualify for the land trust if you make twenty five thousand a year or under. So, um, there's income guidelines for each. I think family family sizes, and I can I can put that on the chat. Um, but um, I think for one person, you have you ha you cannot make uh, for the land trust to qualify for the land trust. Is it fifty four thousand? Like, uh, if you make more than fifty four thousand a year, you may not qualify for the land trust. So it depends on the for indiv for one individual. Not like it depends on your family size, and like that's what what that's what they consider. So our application, we just put it on the the land trust uh, the land land trust qualification numbers, and we go from there. So. And if people don't qualify for the land trust, that's fine. Like you can still, if you don't qualify for the land trust, you, you might be qualified for the family housing uh, down payment program. And like, so we work with people. And sometimes um, I would have said somebody that makes like maybe if you're one individual that's making 100,000 and above, you might not qualify for our program or, or the family housing fund. So um, that's, that's, um, that's a thing. That's, and we had people that, just go through our program that made that amount or more just because they want to like, it was so much educational for them. The educational piece was more important than the, the, than the income, them qualifying for our program. So we had people that made maybe 200 that went through our program that say, you know, um, I, I didn't even know this, how to get in, how to get into home ownership, but this program was so much educational and like uh, they got so much from it. And um, yeah. That's really powerful. I love that, you know, we're building more community-based landlords, regardless of, of income, as well as creating more accessibility to wealth building. So that's that's really powerful. And I hope that folks will see those links in the chat to learn more about that program at Hope. I'm gonna turn it over, turn it back to you, Lena. And I know that, you know, because we're partnering and have done a lot of work in thinking about this program, that there were specific things that went into your mind when you were making this decision about the style of homes that you wanted to develop or have developed for these families. I know this is very personal to you. And so this is a brand new program. Um, can you just kind of walk us through the timelines of when people can expect to see this uh, be birthed and, as well as, um, I'd love for you to dive into um, 
again, like the thinking that went into creating this model, which I know again is personal. Yeah, totally. Um, so we'll start with timelines. We're hoping to close on our construction loans and our investment from the city by June 30th of this year. So we are still tracking towards that and we're still tracking to break ground this summer. So we just hope nothing else pops, nothing else pops up and delays that. If that happens, um, then we're looking at between 12 to 18 months before families can move in. Um, and so we're looking at 2024 before families can move in. Um, and as far as what went into um, consider, you know, designing this project. Um, I, it, it is personal because I am a single mom to an awesome three-year-old. Um, I, I did try the single family home ownership thing and I had some luck and some different things that really helped me, which was a huge thing. But, um, also I still, I wasn't able to do it, um, because there's a lot that goes into single family home ownership around maintenance and having a savings that I didn't have. And, um, it was really emotionally stressful. Um, and so I decided, I don't think this is for me. And that, that whole experience definitely informed this project because I was like, so some of the things about our project too is, and, and the cooperative model was I, I was constantly having dread of like, if I lose my job, like me and Winnie will be homeless in like a month, right? Or two months, whatever that process is. And I was like, that's really scary and it's really heavy. So one of the things we built into the cooperative structure is a three to six month assistance fund. So if a family loses a job, has an illness, something else comes up, they, the cooperative will come in and cover their payments. Hopefully in that time they can get back on their feet, right? So that that's something you don't see in any other models um uh that's that level of care and that again is from the cooperative collective mindset of we're in this together how can we help each other together to navigate uh an economy that was not meant for us and that was built off of our you know the exploitation of our ancestors so um that was a key component of the structure um another one was again around accessibility um having that a thousand dollars down you you can save that up over time right you can that's an accessible amount whereas some of these other houses even if you're looking at three percent down it's hard to save ten thousand twelve thousand twenty thousand dollars to put down so um that is a huge thing. And then this, the second thing is we really went for 60% of area median income. So folks who are making 60% area median income um, are who are eligible to purchase the units. So the other unique thing about our program is it's not like other housing um, initiatives that, that some other like government places do where you have to continue making that income. With our project, if you, as long as you are fall within that and we're going to be working with actually City of Lakes Community Land Trust to be doing that compliance. As long as you fall within that 60% um, AMI, that's what you make, you can get into that home. If in two years you get an awesome job and you are making a lot of money, guess what? You still get to stay in that home, right? That's another key point of building generational wealth um, is, is how do you not put in structures that are meant to help people, but then actually keep them from, from climbing up that socioeconomic ladder. So we wanted to do that. Um, the other piece around our, our, our design was why four bedrooms? Um, and there's a couple pieces around there is when we, we know that oftentimes, um, Oftentimes it falls to mostly women, mostly um, the, the women in the family to do the caretaking of both the children and the elders and other folks. And so you may not have three children that need separate bedrooms, but you might have a cousin, an auntie, an uncle, an elder, a mom, a dad, whoever, that you are also caring for. Um, and so we really wanted to get in those four bedrooms um, to be able to have to help families who are doing that. So we were really looking at this um, in, in that terms of just uh, 
of who our families are taking care of. And we also didn't put any stipulations in, like it doesn't have to be biological related, right? Because that's also something about black and brown communities is often our chosen family is who we're taking care of. It's not necessarily a blood relation. And that is also um, something we've seen in other programs that is a barrier to people um, because they are taking care of dependents that maybe aren't blood related to them, but um, that's still your family and you're still gonna make sure they're okay. So um, those, those are some of the things we wanted to include. And then really, again, leaning into this cooperative mindset and orientation to the world versus an individual one is then like, how do we help each other take care of our families? So maybe, it's, um, hey, I'm popping out to the store because we ran out of, you know, some some peanut butter or something we really need. And can you just be be like on the lookout for a few minutes while I go to the store and run and run and get it right? We wanted that those sorts of supports and mentality to be in there. Um, and then, you know, the deep hope is, I think, also um, as as a single as a single parent. Um, there are often really difficult things our kids encounter in the world and you would like to have other people to talk to about how do I talk to the my child my black child about the fact that the police just killed another person and how do I talk to them at a developmentally appropriate way about what safety looks like for them in their black body how, and you want to have support to talk about that and support to think about how to do that and I personally think that just that happens um, if you can intentionally build community, intentionally build trust. So hopefully you're not holding all so much by yourself and taking a little bit off of off of your shoulders. Um, and so, yeah, that that's definitely um, a lot of how we approach the project. Um, I think the other part of the project, which um, I, thank you for the invitation to talk about it because I haven't talked about it a lot, is, is how to be countercultural in the sense of a hyper focus on consumerism and my wealth and my family and this individualism. Um, how can we be broadening that to thinking about stronger communities, stronger families together as a collective versus just that really hyper focus on the individual. And of course we want individual families to have their self-interest protected, absolutely. And I wanna push back a little bit on this, single family homes is the absolute only way that you can build generational wealth and it's the only way to do it. When I truly believe, and again, a lot informed by my personal experience, that that actually doesn't have to be the way for everyone, and and it's and there might be other ways, um, sort of again, this middle way of cooperative cooperation. And honestly, we can get back to some of our more ancestral focus on togetherness and collectivity um, and raising our kids together, right? Um, so that's that's a big piece of it too for me for for designing this project. I really appreciate that, Lena. Thank you so much for talking about the cultural and community implications of your design. Um, it's part of why when you brought the project to Urban Homeworks, you know, we were really excited about it um, because it really centers exactly what you said, like those ancestral ways of living and being and doing that break us out of these um, very oppressive cycles of capitalism. I want to just kind of speak to our partnership a little bit before I transition back to you, Coco. Um, so in our partnership, you know, Urban Homeworks is the developer for uh, these cooperative units. So it's super exciting for us. And um, I'd love to just share that, you know, Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism purchased eight plots of land in North Minneapolis. Um, so all of the all of, the, all of the units of this cooperative will exist in North Minneapolis in both the fourth ward as well as the fifth ward. So that's really exciting. Um, and, you know, we're really targeting families that are from this community. So similar to like the, the Rondo model of just really focusing on who has been uh, most sort of taken advantage of in these historic financial processes and making sure that families who want to stay in North Minneapolis have capacity to do that. Families that want to return to North Minneapolis have the capacity to do that. Um, and as Lena already mentioned, really targeting Black and Indigenous families specifically in recognition of that. 
Um, so we're also partnering on our educational pieces and making sure that families are super informed about the decisions that they're making in this process of, you know, because in this capitalist system, we talk so much about the individual family progress. It's, it's a mindset shift to start to go back to like holding that space together in community um, as people make financial decisions. And so we are gonna be walking along our families, alongside our families for the long haul, which is really exciting. Um, we don't want we don't want them to fail. You know, this is a project where um, we are diving in together, wanting success, multi-generational success for these families. And so standing alongside of them through the journey. Is there anything that I missed on that, Lena, that you wanted to hold up? No, thank you for that. I did see a question in the chat and I just wanted to mention that, and the question was, um, do are there any shared spaces for the families? And I'll say this first site doesn't have it because we're, we're very constrained um, space-wise. However, we do really hope we can incorporate that into the future sites. Some of that incorporation might actually involve us trying to change the law in the city of Minneapolis. <laughs> Um, and so um, I just want to flag that that is absolutely a hope for the rest of the seven sites that we'll be able to do that. Um, but yeah, it's, yep, it's on the list. Thank it's, you. Thank you for adding that, Asal It's on the list. Yes, perfect. Um, all right, Coco. So I do have a couple of questions for you. I think you hit on a lot of the logistical pieces of land trust, which is super helpful for folks. I think that one of the biggest pieces that would benefit folks hearing from you is just talk about, if you can, the wealth building aspect. Like people think of land trusts as really limiting their capacity for wealth building. Um, and so I'd love for you to just kind of break that down for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the biggest knock on the land trust. So I had, it's not the first time I'm hearing it. So, I mean, I think I'd say a couple of things. So First of all, you know, in that in that example I mentioned just earlier, I mean, um, that person ended up walking away with the 25 percent ended up uh, being something like uh, fifty two thousand two hundred fifty dollars. So it's not that this shared equity home ownership is not giving anybody anything that is a down payment on a home in the for profit market. Um, so I want to just dispel that right off the bat. Uh, but I also think there's some to be said about um, kind of themes that have come up on the call around like what, how are we defining wealth and do we want to be tethered to a white supremacist definition? And I'm not saying, look, money, we need money to survive. So I'm not, I'm not saying no, now we're going to redefine what it means. Uh, but I do think that at least with the folks we interact with, there are different considerations that, that are coming uh, ahead uh, of the financial gain that could come out of this. And so I'll say, when we meet with someone kind of coming in for the first time, talking about a dream of a home, whether, and we do duplex, we do single family, we do all sorts of things, is I want to be in a community where uh, my kid can go to a good school. I want to be somewhere where I'm not afraid to be uh, pushed out at any given moment. Um, you know, so so there are a lot of things that come that are prioritized aside from that wealth. So I'll say that uh, aside from so let's get back to the numbers. So aside from that, kind of you walk away with this chunk of money. Uh, I will say, um, although home ownership has been a wealth generating uh, tool uh, for many communities historically, uh, we've also seen the the very very uh, damaging side of of home ownership when we saw the downturn in the market in 08, you know, uh, 09, uh, and in those scenarios, the land trust actually absorbs the hit. So in many cases, so we absorb seventy five percent of the hit uh, of the market in, when the when the market does downturn, and we do anything we can to have folks still walk away with some money. Uh, even even if, uh, you know, it's impossible to retain someone in a home. So I will also say that. And then something that we talk a lot about too is, um, you know, you can't really underestimate how much folks are saving on a monthly basis from that shared equity home ownership. 
that then enables other things. Uh, and so I, you know, again, I shared the example of like going back to school and getting a PhD. It's not, you know, it's not cheap to go back to school. Uh, so, you know, and, and that's just an example, right? But folk, you know, we've had many homeowners in our in our portfolio who have opened businesses, who have gone back to school, who have sent their children to school uh, with some additional help. And so all those things, again, uh, contribute to living fulfilling lives that includes financial fulfillment, but also other pieces. Um, and the, you know, and the last thing I'll say, which again, gets at more of that collective piece. And I think you mentioned this in your framing comments as well is, you know, capitalism is here, it's doing what it does. And that's kind of why we're having this call in the first place. Um, or at least creates the conditions for these models to, to be emerging in a, in a different way. And so what, what we talk about sometimes is, is that we, our role is to establish essentially a whole alternative housing market that can be a step stone into other options that you might choose down the road. Maybe it's co-op housing. I love it for you. You know, maybe I don't, you know, maybe you want to revert into rental because that's your preference. Um, I think for us, it's just important to understand where is our community at? What are they looking for? And so if that also means life cycle housing in the portfolio, so we have an issue with aging elder or aging uh, folks who can't, can't stay in homes but want to stay in Rondo, where are they going to go? So we created a development with 34 units of senior housing at 30% and AMI and below. So that that's the, you know, wealth, I guess I got off topic, but um that's that's uh, kind of how we think about wealth uh, within the CLT model. Yeah, and I appreciate um, those comments, Coco. I think that what we have in the three of you is just an incredibly comprehensive explanation for folks that are less familiar with the why um, of these pathways. And so I just really appreciate um, all the detail and specificity that each of you have brought. Um, I think that our audience doesn't have a lot of questions, which is a sign that the, the, the topics you hit were the right ones. And so a lot of gratitude to you for that. Um, I am gonna hit the two questions that I have seen come through the chat. And the first one, and we can do this one kind of lightning round, I think, because we are getting close on time, is just uh, who are your programs for? And I'm asking for you to be very, just as specific as you've been, so name the communities that they're for, the income levels that the, that these are for. And, and I know that each of you has said this, but just to pull it out for folks so they can hear it directly. So Coco, I'm going to kick it back to you, actually. All right. I'll try to be quick. So uh, we work with uh, anyone in St. Paul and, Ram and broader Ramsey County. So that's our geographic focus. Our income uh, limits are 80% AMI or below. Although in 2022, 66% of folks we work with were 60% and below. So we try to drive to that deeply affordable. Um, and we have specific programs that have specific eligibility. For example, our right to return programs, that kind of thing, where obviously that's a, tie, a specific tie to the neighborhood um, to, and, and to a historical uh, event that took place that display that created mass displacement. So generally black uh, in that in that space. Although there, you know, it could be that there were others living in, in at the time that also got displaced. Great, thank you so much for that, Mel. You and we'll pop it to you. Yes, I would say the same thing with the Coca said about the income eighty percent and below or like six percent and below. That's who we serve. I would say also Indigenous, um, Black, uh, East Africans, um, that's who we serve. And um, we we thought our program was going to be just focused on Philips, but it has, like, we, we're getting people from anywhere, basically, like, you know, um, we're getting people from um, West St. Paul, different uh, people are just fig figuring out our program, and we're not just focused on Philips anymore. We're focused on helping people that qualify for our program. Uh, that can benefit from our program, and um, yeah, that's what matters to me. That that's what matters to our organization, and we're serving uh, people of color and indigenous Black uh, communities. Perfect. Thanks so much, Melian. Lena, 
Yeah, our project is specific to Black and Indigenous single parents making 60% of that area median income. And I'll just put a little caveat here that at the beginning of the project, it was single mothers, um, but we got a little pushback on that um, saying, you know, there might be uh, folks that don't identify as mothers. Um, and so we um, adjusted and we are, you know, thinking of how to be more inclusive in that. Um, yeah, while also paying particular attention to the oppressions that women and mothers do particularly face. So, um, yeah. Perfect. Thanks so much, Lena. Um, so we're getting more questions, I think, as we threaten to end, more questions are rolling in. So y'all in the audience, I'm, I'm going to do my best to get your questions answered in the order that they came in. If we end and it, your question went unanswered, please email us. We will get you a response. All right. We are just, we got two minutes and there's a couple more things we wanted to hit. So I'm not going to get to everybody's question. Um, one of the questions that I think would be really helpful for the audience and this will probably be the last one that we can hit today, but as you all are holding different spaces and families are considering these opportunities that are amazing and powerful for different families, how might you encourage them to think about the decision of which of these programs would be right for them? So I'll just give you a second because that's a kind of unique question, but like sort of what are the questions that you might encourage families to ask themselves when considering purchasing a land trust home, when considering going into cooperative housing, when considering becoming a duplex or triplex landlord? What are the questions that would help them make that decision? I'll give you a few, a few moments here. Um, and the team is writing down everyone's questions. Again, so go ahead, you can keep asking them in the chat. We will email you. So if you need to um, include your contact information so we can get back to you, that would be great. And Mel Yoon, looks like you're ready to go. Yeah, so when we do the one-to-one, -one, we specifically ask people, um, are you interested buying a duplex, a single family home? So if they're interested in single family home and they wanna use the land trust model, then I will be like, here, where do you wanna buy? Do you wanna buy in St. Paul? We have partnership with Rondo Community Land Trust. So here's the connect, you can connect with them. You, uh, you know, people have already attended uh, the land trust orientation when they, come, uh, when they come to our training. So if they are still confused on the land trust and how it works, we ask them to, uh, to schedule a specific, uh, to attend the land trust orientation again with, um, you know, with the land trust. And then uh, if they're interested in buying a duplex, you know, we, um, like I said, we ask them what's the barrier, you know, like you have completed the six week training. What is your barrier? You know, is it credit? You need to get a job. What does that look like? So we create a plan with folks and like, we don't say just because you, you know, you are buying a duplex, you're not buying a duplex, you cannot attend our program or we're not helping you. So um, I'm, I'm here as long as people are, um, you know, are following their goals, they're, you know, they're doing the necessary steps. I will be there, whether it's like one year from now that they wanna buy or two years from now. So like, I think that's the uniqueness of our program. It's like, you don't just graduate from our program. It's like, we follow through with you, you know, like we're here for you. Um, um, maybe I'll check with you six times, you know, a year figuring out where you are, but it all depends on where they are with their goals and like how far they are with their credit, what's, you know, what's stopping them from becoming homeowners and all that stuff. And that's, that's great, Melian. Thank you so much. And, and we really love the work of Hope and love your work and are so grateful to be partners to you all. So shout out to Hope Communities. Lena. Mm -hmm. So I think um, there's two pieces of this. The first piece is ensuring families understand the cooperative model because it's different. It's new to a lot of people and um, it requires some different things than um, single family home ownership or rental um, or some other models. So we want to be really clear with folks that what it means to be owning, living and operating a cooperative. Um, so that's first and foremost. And then I think the second thing is really bringing people through a process of understanding their own wants and desires, as well as their own limitations. So it's really important to think about, like, if you want this one particular thing, 
uh, but you have a limitation that you either are willing to work on, are willing to to move or budge, then maybe you can reach for that thing. But if you don't want to work on that, then maybe you need to adjust what you want. And so a really great example of that, this is cooperative living does require you to be more social, more interactive, more engaging with your neighbors in a really intentional ways. So if you have a limitation, or we could reframe that as just like a way of being in the world of like wanting to be more introverted, more quiet, and not really wanting to interact a lot, like right off that, that's going to be a challenge then for you in the cooperative structure. So you either want to think about then, oh, is this the right structure for me? Or am I willing to try to stretch myself? And sometimes, you know, I think we all have areas where we're like, yeah, I'm willing to work on that. And then there's other areas where we're like, nah, like I'm, I'm in my 40s now. I'm not working on that anymore. So <laughs> I think, you know, um, doing those two things for, for people, making crystal clear um, for folks what it is a cooperative is, and then helping navigate folks through that. Like, um, if you think you want this, what are some, you know, challenges or orientations that you might have to stretch and then we we want to be there to help support you in that um and uh and in coming to the other side or we want to help you to realize you know like it's not a good fit and like a like yeah and that's that's where we're orienting to this yep that's perfect thanks so much lena coco really fast what are the questions for land trust yep um i would just say um to just be, again, very clear on the goals coming in and very clear on what the land trust is and is not. And uh, I feel like we have to have like a yearly like, hey, remember what we talked about, like when we come back to selling where we're at. So uh, but similar to, other, you know, other comments that were made, I would just say that we don't leave people in a vacuum. So we'll leave people alone because it's like you're here to buy a house. I get it but you can be as involved or not as you want to be. And we want to follow you along your journey. So if you tell us from day one, I want to open a business, I want to know what your idea is, and I'm going to start looking for a commercial space for you. So that's the kind of uh, wraparound. So I'll stop there. That's great. Thanks y'all so much. As we uh, begin to wrap up our session today, I just want to thank the audience for hanging with us. Really appreciate you. There's a couple of legislative uh, bills that are on the table right now that will support families in becoming homeowners. Um, the first one is a bill for $176 million of down payment assistance for first generation home buyers. The details are in the chat, but that's a bill that we support um, here at Urban Homeworks and really hope that you all will be willing to lend your voice, whether it's through a letter or a phone call to your representatives in support of that bill. Um, Urban Homeworks is also um, advocating for a bill for $10 million for us to build homes specifically for deeply affordable home ownership. We've all named in this panel that housing stock for deeply affordable ownership is limited and families are really struggling to even have the opportunities that these programs that you see here today um, give them space for. And so we really do have to actually construct homes that are deeply affordable. And so um, that bill is Senate file 3119. It's directly to Urban Homeworks for us to develop deeply affordable housing for families making 50 to 60% of the area median income. Thank you all so much for being here. Please support each of these organizations doing powerful, meaningful work for our communities, working to repair the harm of historic systemic housing injustice, y'all. These things are still happening today. These programs are still needed today. So let's work together um, to bring change to the Twin Cities, the change that I know everyone here wants to see. Thanks so much for your time again. I know I'm six minutes over. Gratitude to the community. So grateful. See you all next time. <laughs>